Hello, everybody. Um, welcome back. And I'd like to welcome today Deirdre O'Neill, a filmmaker, working class academic and all round fab woman. Um, <laughs> thank you for coming on. That's fine. After that introduction, I feel like I, just, I should have come on. Yeah. <laughs> um, we met um, at something called um, Britain has class. It was an event in London, wasn't it? I was dead excited to see that. I saw it pop up on Twitter and I thought, oh, this is exciting because I'd been involved in sort of left politics for a few years and it seemed really difficult to get the issue and the topic of class on the agenda at all. You know, it seemed like a really not only um, neglected, but unpopular you know, mm -hmm. issue to, to bring up in, in that um, sort of sphere. So this was a, an event which was dedicated to looking at the issue of the fact that there is still a working class in Britain. Um, and so I was dead excited. And so I didn't, I couldn't really afford it, but I went down on the train and um, you were presenting there about your film, The That's Acting right. Class. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Um, so yeah. I'll ask you a bit more about your film and your work in, in a bit, but I just wanted to ask you the first question, which is, um, do you consider yourself to be working class? Yes, you do. I mean, yeah. <laughs> yeah, of course. I mean, I don't see how I can't be working class. Um, I, you know, and it is. I mean, I, I, I'm sure one of the reasons you're asking me is because that that kind of idea that if you're an academic or if you've got a PhD, somehow you can't be working class anymore. Um, and I, I mean, lots of people have said that to me. And it, like, if you get into an argument on Twitter, it's one of the things people like to throw at you. And you think, well, hang on a minute, you know? Um, I lived on a council estate until I was 44. Um, I left school at 16 with no, well, I had a CSC, C, CFD, yeah. I think it was, yeah, in uh, English. And that was it. Um, and, you know, my mum was a school dinner lady and a cleaner. My dad worked on a building site. Um, and I just did a, a series of kind of dead end jobs. By the time I was 23, I was living on a council estate as a single parent, cleaning the houses of the middle classes, cash in hand, you know, a benefit sheet. I was what's called a benefit sheet. Um, then I went to university at 35, did an MA, and then did a PhD, spent 20 years doing part-time um, zero hour contracts at the university, you know, from, so I was lecturing and cleaning at the same time, because um, my daughter was growing up, we were still on the council estate. Um, and, you know, the idea that because I'm now an academic with a proper contract and I have a PhD, that that cancels out Mm. all those years mm. all those experiences mm. you know being working class isn't an identity isn't it something you can just say oh I'm working class or I'm not it's a relationship it's the relationship in the kind of Marxist sense to the forces of production but also in the Marxist sense it's a kind of social relations it's how you fit into the world and it's your relationship with the institutions that you have to come you know be in contact with every day and my relationship with the world has been formed by those experiences of growing up working class, you know, growing up poor. I mean, things are a lot worse now than when I was growing up mm -hmm. in the 60s and 70s. But, you know, we still, on a Thursday night, we had to wait till my dad got paid so we could go to the fish and chip shop because we'd run out of food. And in those days, you put... Um, to keep your electricity going, you put money into the electricity, you put like 50p. Mm -hmm. And you know, sometimes we sat in the dark until my dad came home because we'd run out of money. We had no electricity. Everything mm -hmm. would just go off. Mm -hmm. And that was it. Mm -hmm. um, so, you know, the idea that you can just kind of roll that back to a kind of year zero and all of a sudden, oh no, you're not working class anymore, seems to me absurd. Mm -hmm. There is also, I think, a kind of element of snobbery involved that oh why can't I be a working class person with a PhD you know are, are working class people too thick to ha get a PhD you know mm. I'm a working yeah. class person with a PhD I didn't yeah. stop being a working class person mm. um 
so yes is the answer to your question yeah. I am still working class yeah yeah yeah, it is. It's interesting. It's one of the things I, I call it like a firewall that can get thrown yeah. up. There's a certain things that people, when you bring up the issue of class, they will throw at you to either prove that class isn't an issue anymore or to prove that mm. class is something that is fluid and that people flip between classes with ease, you know, um, so it's not as relevant or they'll bring in the Marxist things. I mean, I'll, I'll, I'll come back to some of those in a bit. Um, but there's also as well as that comment, there's also, I think, I mean, I don't know if you feel this, but if, but there's a lot of people who are from working class backgrounds who've done well, who then naturally find themselves in a more middle class dominated domain, wherever it is, whether it's politics, academia or law mm. or, you know, whatever, in business or whatever, that they, I think there are studies around this as well, that they're less likely to kind of be able to go as far as fast and their mm -hmm. class still mm -hmm. holds them back mm -hmm. and they're still perceived mm -hmm. as being different. Um, so you can't yeah. win. You're kind of told, well, you can't be working class because you're yeah. now an, an academic. Um, but at the same time, the other academics around you very much are aware that you're not middle class. Yeah, um, is that your, do you... Does that resonate? No, I think. Uh, I mean, I think you're absolutely right. I mean, I think there's been some research. I mean, there's a lot of kind of talk, you know, in the main mainstream press. I mean, mm. we always hear about the gender pay gap. We very rarely hear about the class pay gap. And people from working class um, backgrounds, like you say, they can end up in middle class professions. Uh, that's less and less um, the case, actually, but they still do. Um, but, you know, there is a definite pay gap between people who have started off mm -hmm. um, as uh, working class and yeah. end up in these working class professions and people who are middle class. I mean, and I think that's for various reasons. I think it's because we tend to go to less prestigious universities. I didn't go to a Russell Group University. So you don't yeah. have that kind of network yes. that you get. You know, you don't have parents that can support you why you're kind of, um, you know, if it's academia, why you're writing your articles or, you know, doing your PhD, you don't, you know, if it's the media, like, mm -hmm. you know, the film that you're talking about that we made, that was about the lack of working class people in the acting profession. And the acting profession is dominated by the privately educated middle and upper middle class. And one of the reasons is for that is because middle class people have parents who will support them while they live in London. It's very London centric. Mm -hmm. um, you know, they'll pay their rent so they can hang around for years, go into auditions, taking little parts here and there and then be discovered overnight and then bitch about, oh, God, you know, people don't like me because I'm middle class. Yeah. But, you know, it's it's not that people don't like them. It's that there's a kind of understandable resentment that yeah. it's so easy Yeah. when, you know, and I think Dave O'Brien, uh, he did some research and something that he called the leaky pipeline that whereas the middle classes can stay and wait around until they're in their late 20s, early 30s, even longer, mm -hmm. you know, as working class people get older, they have to take on jobs. They, you know, they get a mortgage, they get a mm -hmm. family, they, mm -hmm. they leave. Yeah. They leave. You think they um, get tired as well, you know, yeah, because, yeah. because maybe, I mean, most of us don't get an education in class and how class discrimination works. Um, you might learn about racism or sexism these days, but you won't really mm. talk about classism. No. And the same as with racism and sexism, some of it's overt and obvious. So like someone calling someone a chav or something like that, you know, might be an obvious expression mm. of classism, but, um, but a lot of it's subtle. You can't mm. really evidence it, but it's there and it's yeah. really powerful. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. Yeah. And, it, and so you don't go, maybe a lot of people don't go into their, um, profession expecting the barriers those barriers to be as strong as they are and it takes a few years really of knocking up against them for people to realize mm -hmm. actually there's a ceiling you know and it's um it's tiring to come up against that you know repeatedly kind of thing I mean how did you manage to break through it what happened I mean I, I, I don't I don't think I have I mean that's the thing I don't think I have I mean I mean I, my background I, I mean, I just, you know, <laughs> went on about my background, but my dad was, um, he came from Belfast. He was a, 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 an Irish uh, working class Catholic. And in Belfast in the 1950s, it, you know, the, it's another layer of discrimination. With a Catholic name, you couldn't get a job. Mm -hmm. So he came over here at 16 
and started to work and build in sight. So he could send money back to his mum and he couldn't read or write. Um, and he taught himself and he taught himself by, and this is a bit of a cliche as someone pointed out to me and I'm really sorry it's a cliche, but it happened to be true. Yeah, you know, he taught himself reading Marx and Engels. Mm. And of course he passed that on to us and he mm. passed that, yeah. So we were brought up in that kind of environment. Mm -hmm. So we have always been aware of class. I mean, it's paid a, you know, my dad was a trade unionist, um, you know, he went on civil rights marches. I mean, you know, he worked very closely with the kind of um, black people who had come over here. There was no white working class and Irish working class and black, work, you know, mm -hmm. as far as my dad was concerned, there was a working class and that yeah. was a global working class. Yeah. Um, so, I mean, it's, I've always been aware of it, maybe, maybe hyper aware of it, maybe like some people you say aren't aware of it. So, yeah, you know, I remember when my daughter was growing up and I thought, oh, I'm fed up with cleaning the houses with middle classes. And I started to do evening classes. Mm -hmm. um, and I got, was doing um, sociology. Oh, wow. And yeah. 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 <laughs> and it, it was great. Um, and um, as a guy that taught me, John Rose, He's bloody brilliant. I found out afterwards, I met him at um, a Marxism conference. He was a <laughs> member of the SWP. I didn't realise that at the time. But I remember the first lesson we had, it was A-level sociology. And he said, how many people in this room are working class? Mm -hmm. And even then, it was just me and a young black bloke put our hands up. And he said, you are no longer working class or you won't be considered working class because you're doing A-levels. Working okay. class kids don't do A levels. This was a, wow. a you know, yeah. Um, and he really, he really encouraged me to go to university. But I thought, and then you go to university, and I went to university, and I went to the University of North London, mm -hmm. as was then, thinking, oh, not everyone will be white and mm -hmm. eighteen and middle class. But actually, a lot of them were. Yeah, a lot of them were. Uh, there were blokes who were in their thirties, and their mum was paying their rent. <laughs> Um, there were there was a woman whose father owned um, factories. Mm -hmm. You can't help being countries. envious of that, can you? You just, in a but way, you, it's yeah. yeah. I mean, I, not envious. I mean, I, no. yeah, envious, but also just really angry that it's so mm. easy for them. Yes, it's irritating. It's so easy. Yeah. yeah. You know, it's, it's a real eye opener, isn't it? In some way. Exactly, yes. exactly. Yes. So you become more aware of your mm -hmm. class position, I think, as you go through it. Mm -hmm. You know, it's like so yeah. you're not and but you're not breaking through that you're not breaking through that class mm. feeling. It's no. still like you'll be in a room, especially now, you know, you'll be in a room with a group of people and you're the only one that's not been privately educated. Mm. You're the only one that's never been skiing. Yeah. You know, it's yes, yeah. So it's there all and it becomes so that's more still there. Pronounced. It does. Yes. Yeah. yeah. So you're sort of moving in that world, but it's like almost being a spectator or being in a separate bubble yeah. or something. Mm. There's there's like a yeah. like a like this uh, I don't know. I, it's a really strange I find it a really strange position to be in you're always excluded in some yeah. way you know in, in, yeah. in some sense yeah um I, and it and is it, it is yeah oh, sorry <laughs> yeah no just uh, that as well it, um the other thing that I found because I did like you I went to classes I was in a, in a bed sit with my little girl I think I was maybe 18 thereabouts by the time I started to get fed up and think oh, I've, got, I've got to do something you know about yeah. this so and I did go back to college and did sociology I was so nervous you know I thought yeah. what am I doing why do I even think that I can do but it's so important isn't it for people mm -hmm. to kind of um, get over that working class people to get over that self-doubt and just give it a shot mm -hmm. because mm -hmm. it can really be a fork in the road if you learn about class and you understand it better but it's a double-edged sword. So all of a sudden, all of the things that you've been able to see, but maybe not make a hundred percent sense of, I mean, maybe you could because you had this education from your dad at home. Mm. Um, but for me, it was like, I'd been a working class kid in a grammar school. I could see that there were unfairnesses, but I couldn't really see it as a system, if you know what I mean, right. no, and make no, sense yeah. of it and fit it all together. And then when I learned sociology, I was like, oh, wow, you know, there's whole theories about this. This has been talked about forever. It's recognized, it's systematized, you know, it's kind of, you can understand it. It opens your eyes, 
but there's really sod all you can do about it. <laughs> so <laughs> not what well, seems that way. So it's kind of like it's a double edged thing, isn't it? Having your eyes open to it, traveling through it, getting to see it. So you're not just surrounded by people from the same background as you, but all of a sudden you're able to move in, in a different world. So you've got qualifications and, you know, your career takes you there, um, but you're not part of that world. But you're also not part of the world that you've come from in a lot of ways yeah. because no. they, they haven't had yeah. that class education and they don't yeah. see what the problem is a lot of the time you know so there's a, there's a great article by um um a, a working um, diane ray do you know her she's oh a, you put me in touch with her a while ago uh, she was in education yeah she yeah. and she she wrote a really great article um which was called finding yourself losing yourself oh wow and what she argues i mean it's, it's basically what you're saying here is that for the middle classes yeah. when they go to university it's about finding themselves and expanding mm -hmm. their but often for working class people it's about losing yourself because you leave so much behind mm -hmm. And it's really, you know, I, I do, yeah, you know, I do consider myself working class. I, you know, my friends are, I've had the same friends that I grew up with on a council estate. I mean, you know, they are still my friends. Yeah. But, you know, there is a sense. And I remember my mum kind of, you know, saying to me, oh, are we going to be able to understand what you're talking about now? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it's, that, it's like that, that, that kind of, you know, for some working, and my mum was English, you know, but for some working class people, there is a kind of suspicion of education. Mm. Um, yeah. But, you know, but like you say, it's really interesting. I There's a guy I know, he runs something called Open Book up at Goldsmiths, where he gets um, ex-prisoners to do mm -hmm. their degrees. And he said, you know, since he did his degree, he did a history degree, it's been the longest period when he hasn't been in trouble. Right. So, yeah, and it's that like exactly what you're saying. So you kind of you're able to find, I think, an outlet for your frustrations or your mm. inability to understand what's going on. It does yes. become clearer. Even yes. because, you know, like yes, my dad did give us that kind of political education. Mm -hmm. But being able to kind of talk about that in a more formal sense. Yeah. And articulate it more formally. Yeah. I think it's really, really important. Yes. Yeah. And I think it's something the working class have lost actually you know mm. that kind of autodidactic thing that my dad had where you taught yeah. yourself yeah you know, and there were yeah. reading clubs and places you could go and yeah you know but all of that is gone mm -hmm. and that and that's a massive problem for yeah. the working class I think that lack yeah. of a political education I agree I agree and I think it's I mean I'm part of a political education group at the moment um and I I mean I've because I like I've had this opportunity to go to university to learn about how to structure essays and look at things critically and evidence what you're saying and look at what kind of evidence is uh, that more valuable than others you know uh, more robust than others and it's important because it gives you an orientation we were sort of saying about along those lines yeah I mean not only an orientation but I mean I think you know <sighs> You know, class exists whether we're conscious of it or not. And I mean, that's yeah. the important thing, isn't it? Yeah. That you have that class consciousness. Yes. And, it, you know, it's exactly the same way as you were talking about, like, you know, going to university. I mean, once you understand how the system works, mm -hmm. then you can start to build the tools to dismantle yeah. the system. But you can't yeah. do that otherwise. Yeah. So you yeah. get, you know, and you can see it, you can see it particularly amongst kind of, you know, I've worked in prisons and you see it with, in working class boys, you know, mm -hmm. the anger and the frustration and the vulnerability to conspiracy theories. Yes. You know, yeah. this idea that we're ruled by green lizards, you yeah. know, and when you, when you sit down and talk to them, you think actually what you're presenting me with is a political analysis. Yeah. But what you're unable to do is identify. Yes. You know, so you yeah. talk about green lizards. Yeah, actually, it's you know, awful when you, you think of that because that's really an example of working class people not being given any answers. Mm -hmm. They can see something is wrong, mm -hmm. can't really. They're not given any yeah. educational support to identify what that is, and they're searching for that answer. Mm -hmm. um, and those things are presented, and it seems to be the closest thing that they can find to an answer as to why this unfairness oh, exists. Absolutely, and I yeah. think partly it's because we don't have a sense of our own history. We're yeah. not taught working class history. We were still taught the history of, you know, great people. I mean, I remember my dad, 
getting really, really angry mm-hmm. <laughs> that we weren't taught about Irish history in a yeah. Catholic school. Yes. Where nearly every single one of us was the there was the child of, you know, first generation Irish immigrants. Yeah. Um, and we weren't taught Irish history. So we were taught nothing about colonialism and imperialism. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, we didn't understand, you know, how the English had gone across the globe mm. and subjugate different races in different countries. Yeah. Um, and my dad used to get really angry about that. And I think, and he filled in those gaps for us. Yeah. We were very much brought up in that yeah. kind of Irish Republican tradition. And yeah. I just wonder, you know, if you don't have someone who's filling in those gaps for you, then not only do you not know, but it makes you feel inadequate because it makes you feel like you've never achieved anything or the people that yeah. you belong to have never achieved anything. Yeah, yeah. That's a really important point. My, um, I've had this dilemma because my kids are, work- we're working class. Um, you know, our windows are falling out of the frames and we've got cupboard doors off that have never gone back on and things break and we can't fix them. And, you know, but we're okay. We're not going hungry or anything like that. But we live in a very affluent area and they go to a school where most of the kids there have probably had access to private tutoring at the very least, you know. So it's not an, it's a very uneven and very visibly uneven playing field for them. And they've gone into that school. And obviously, because I'm involved in politics and I'm passionate about things like class, they do hear that from me. Um, I think it's helped them to put some shape to some of the unfairnesses and injustices they see within school, which kids get picked out and given the most attention mm-hmm. and which kids kind of get sidelined and ignored and how you sink You start off with good results, but you sink gradually down as the confidence Mm -hmm. takes a hit and things like that. Um, And I mean, particularly my my daughter's really struggled with that. And you you wonder yourself whether it's helpful to, you know, for them to be enlightened about this big unfair system that they can't do anything about. But on the other side of it, you feel, well, if they don't understand about that, they are always going to feel like it's them that's inadequate. But within that environment, even understanding about class being compared and found less than on a daily basis, it still batters your Mm self-confidence, you know, even, Mm -hmm. even if you've got a family that understand about class. I mean, do you think that understanding about class from a child, from your childhood put you in strong, in a stronger position really to be able to step outside of and find some tools to do something about that? I think the biggest thing about understanding about class is and I mean you still do it to a certain extent but you're less likely to blame yourself for yeah. like you say your failings for not yeah. measuring up yeah. you don't see it as an individual you you realize it's the system yeah it doesn't mean that you don't often feel inadequate or you yeah. don't often feel like you know that whole kind of I mean that imposter syndrome I'm I mean, I used to think about that a lot and I have thought about that a lot. And I just think it's not so much an imposter syndrome as the fact that we're functioning in a culture that we don't understand. Mm -hmm. That's, you know, we're not imposters. We just, it's like living in an alien world sometimes. Absolutely, Um, yeah. But I think that is the one thing, like you say, if your girl is struggling and I think, you know, particularly in the kind of competitive environment that schools foster, Mm -hmm. the, you know, the tendency is to blame yourself for not working hard enough, for not yeah. being good enough, for not understanding. Yeah. And I think if you have a kind of insight into the way in which the system functions and every yeah. element of this is structural, you know, so yes. we're talking about the education system. Yeah. And working class kids are set up to fail. Yes. I mean, that's what the education is. They're set up yes. to fail. Yes. Um, yeah. So if your daughter or any working class kid realises that, yeah. then it's not about them as an individual it's they not. it is a much larger thing yeah yeah, yeah. but it is it's is hard as well because you're kind of admitting to them that you can't you're not gonna succeed in that yeah. environment yeah. It's, kind, it's kind of impossible I mean it's it's when they get out of that situation and if they're lucky and they manage to land on a course I mean now she's in college and she's in Liverpool it's a lot more of a working class city and environment yeah. and she's doing music which is much more of a leveling thing it's about what you can do and what your natural skill is you know still she went in feeling you know I can't possibly measure up that lasted a a year you know Mm. uh, before she was able to kind of get to grips with okay that's the damage that's been done I can move forward from that you know so it's quite quite a deep amount of and I think also that the political I mean people say schools are apolitical and we're not allowed to talk about certainly not anything Mm -hmm. anti-capitalist within a school environment but I know within her school um 
kids had had things said to them like I mean one of them one of the teachers showed the kids houses council house and a big detached house and asked them which house it was the head of year at the time which house do you want to you know, end up living in, how hard you work now is going to turn on a thought. There's so much more oh to it than God. that. And, oh my know, God, oh my God, really? What a thing to say, that's like for the kids. Awful. I know, but that's the kind of thing that still goes on. And yet we're told schools are supposed to be apolitical, but that's there throughout the whole culture of the but school. That's, that's, the, that's the yeah. whole, that's exactly what I'm saying. So yeah. if you don't work hard enough, you'll end yeah. up on a council estate with yeah. all the other losers. Yes. But if you work yeah. hard, yes. you'll end up in a big detached have. and we yeah. know that's bollocks and we just, know that it's got nothing to do with how hard you work how yeah. talented you are yes and, and that's an incredible yeah. thing to say to, to children yeah. but yeah. the other thing that you're saying about your daughter and I think it's something that people often don't understand about coming from a working class background and the kind of struggle and the, the fact that you know you're discriminated against because you're working class mm-hmm. is the trauma Yes, that you have to, you know, it traumatizes. It does. You. Yes, it does. You know, That's and, the right and word. you have to live with that. You, yeah. Ha- yeah, it's like a, you know, we talk about kind of post traumatic, and I'm not, I'm not belittling what people go through and end up with post traumatic stress syndrome. I'm not belittling that for a, a, a moment, but for a lot of working class people, you know, poverty and violence and deprivation has a lasting effect on you, and it yeah. has a psychological effect. Mm. You know. I mean, I, I mean, I didn't, you know, like I said, we were poor and I've got, I, I, what's it called a chip on my shoulder, but as another academic that comes from working class background, Bev Skegg said to me when I was talking to her and she said, no, it's not a chip. It's a justifiable anger. Yeah. And that's what you have to remember. Yeah. You are absolutely justified in feeling the way that you feel about yeah. the way the world has treated you. Yeah. But I, like I say, I think, you know, <clears throat> And that, you know, that very, even that thing, that kind of scene that you're painting with the teacher, that's going to have an effect on a child from a working class background or lives on a council estate mm. to be constantly told yeah. that, you know, that you're, you're lacking. There's something yes. wrong with you because yeah. you're not living. It's an incredibly neoliberal, Thatcherite way of mm-hmm. looking at the world, I think. Mm-hmm. It is. It is. It's, it is. I think it's probably not a culture that applies in all schools. It's just no. it happens to in, in this one. But that's going to affect a lot of the kids in that school, you know, very directly. I, I agree with you that, that, that it's important to give people, working class people, the permission for that justifiable anger. And just to kind of rewind just earlier on, I'd said something about you can't help but feel envious. I want to kind of clarify on that because that's something else that sometimes gets leveled at people with regards class is that it's um, inverted snobbery or mm. that it's that, that there's class, class envy, envy yeah. you know like penis envy the same kind of thing but it's like it's not an envy of I, I mean I think a lot of people who are working class they fe- they're happy about their backgrounds mm. they're, they're happy mm. about the fact you know mm. and even some of the adversity that you come up against it can make you stronger I mm. do feel that there's I mean it's not good that people have to endure the extent of suffering that they do but if you never have to um, push yourself if you never come up against your own edges you're kind of almost a child throughout your whole life Mm -hmm. as well there's somewhere in between Mm -hmm. that so there's some valuable things um, with regards working class culture it's a little bit harsher in some ways but it's more loving in other ways you know it's Mm -hmm. unique and Mm -hmm. um, I don't wish that I would have been brought up middle class Mm. by any means because I think a lot of middle class kids are under pressure to compete it's Mm. very Mm. much it's all down Mm. to you as an individual I I think it's an interesting I mean I I think that's one of the things that differentiates working class people from middle class people is the kind of socialization processes that we go through they're very very different they are and I have been one of the things that really amazed me when I went to university is you go with for a coffee with a few people and at the end when the bill came they would go oh well you had this and that and you oh so you've got to get oh you can take that amount off oh but you had oh you had extra cream on your drinking chocolate and you know in the culture that I came from you just pay someone then oh I'll get it yeah and it was this like really even that, at that level this kind of, and these people weren't poor no. um <laughs> I, I, I you know and my dad always used to say by time the middle class person has got their hands in their pocket you've already paid for the round um 
<laughs> and I remember that kind of really hit me when I went to university. But I think, it, yeah, it, it's that kind of social where because you're so poor, because things are so hard, you learn to share. Mm -hmm. And you learn to support people who are going through bad times. Yeah. And, you know, you're taught the importance of family and community, mm -hmm. all of those things, which yeah. I just don't think middle class people, I don't think they had that. I've no. never noticed that with middle class people. No, um, I, I've seen some really weird things like um, middle class people who've had hand houses kind of bequeathed to them at the start of their marriage by their dad, you know, um, and borrowed the money or used an inheritance to put a huge extension on the house but they send their kids into school in clothes that don't fit them that are yeah. second hand because yeah. they like to give the impression that the reason they have all these things is because they're penny pinching mm. so they don't put mm. the heating on until December oh, no. everybody yeah. has to know about it like you know <laughs> they say I'm proud of myself I haven't put my heating on and you think that's not why you're rich <laughs> 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 no, that, yeah, no, that is true. That kind of, and it's interesting, isn't it? Um, Sam Friedman and Dave O'Brien have just done that um, that kind of um, research into um, kind of middle class people who claim that they're working class. You know, oh, three yeah. generations ago, their their grand, great great yeah. great great grandmother was in service, mm -hmm. <laughs> and I just again, I mean, I think, I mean, I I remember writing about that a few years ago myself, but there is this kind of really weird and the problem with that is you're not going to be able to build anything if people don't admit to their privileges yeah. mm -hmm. you really aren't you know um, you've got to be a, you know so this isn't a kind of oh let's all slag the middle classes off there's no. a really you know and it's like Engels said you're not talking about individual members you're talking about the class you're talking about the system and the structure absolutely structures. yes yeah. Yeah. so you know I I just think that it, there's no point in you saying, oh, I, you know, I went to a private school, I've got this big hat, oh, but I'm working class as well. It's like, mm -hmm. no, you're not. Mm -hmm. You're not. And you're, you're negating my experiences mm -hmm. and you're negating my attitudes by saying that you are. It's yes. another kind of yeah. injury, if you like, against it the working class. Absolutely. By saying that yeah. you're working class as well. And mm -hmm. I know you're not. And you yes. know you're not. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. It's and, like you know, and I'm really, really sorry that you got to where you are because you have rich parents and they know someone and mm -hmm. you went to a Russell Group University, even though you're not particularly bright. I'm mm -hmm. really sorry. But, you know, claiming some kind of meritocratic status that, oh, you mm -hmm. have to work really hard or you're really talented, mm -hmm. you know. Yeah. It, it's just not on. Whereas, of it's course, not. We know that working class people their route into education is so different. Yeah. You know, your route, my route. Yeah. We've had to fight to get there while bringing up children and working yes. and yeah. you know, living in shit houses. Absolutely. They don't do that. No. You, you have to fight against self-doubt as well. That's another mm. big battle, isn't it? Even just to get you through the door, really, yeah. in a lot yeah. of ways. Yeah. yeah. Have you got... Um, I want to hear more about your, um, your current work because you've set up this new journal. Mm -hmm. um, and also about your films so the acting class we've talked a little bit about that is that that's the first sort of major film making that you were involved in no it's our third film I mean oh, I right. film. yeah no it's our third film so what that, that was 11 years ago now but we um we went and lived in Venezuela for a year oh right um because at that time Chavez was still alive yeah and <clears throat> We just wanted to be somewhere where there was or seems to be a real alternative to capitalism. And Chavez is I'd love to go there. there. Yeah. I mean, I think things have changed now since he died. Mm -hmm. But so we went there and we spent a year. And what I did, actually, it's interesting what we took, go back to education. So my daughter really suffered at school. It was really difficult for her. I took her out for a year um, because she was being bullied. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, she... The, the teachers were actually giving her wrong information. I was forever up the school. Uh, it was a nightmare. I hated it. So I home educated my son. Wow. So it's quite interesting, all these people that are panicking about home education. My son didn't go to school till he was 17. Right. Um, yeah. But so we took him to Venezuela with us when he was nine. Amazing. And we spent a year there and we made a film about the Bolivarian oh. Revolution. Oh, my and goodness. I haven't seen it's it. On, oh, it's online. It's, it's so free. Yeah. No, I'll send you the link. Okay. Um, and it was really incredible. And again, it goes back to what we were talking about. There are all these kids from the barrios. Mm -hmm. 
mm-hmm. you know, you know, the re- really, really poverty stricken. And they were reading Marx and they were reading Gramsci. Mm-hmm. And Chavez opened the, he set up a university just for the kids from the barrios. And they were doing their degrees, but not for status, not for money. They did their degree and then they took them back into their community. So whatever their degree was in, Mm -hmm. It was about going back and then passing on that knowledge and helping build up their communities. The university, in the mornings, it provided um, a free breakfast for all the students and the local community. Wow. Uh, A a free lunch for the community and a small snack in the evenings. My son played uh, baseball. He did karate classes. There were, I mean, it was just a really different way of approaching education, yeah. making it much more holistic. Mm-hmm. It was a real, I mean, I don't want to get into something about, but, but, but there were problems as well. But anyway, yeah. so we, that was our first film. Um, right. And that was interesting because wherever we showed that, it's a, it, it, honestly, it's a bit like the right wingers now, wherever we showed that, Mm-hmm. these right-wing Venezuelans would show so even if we were in Galway in Ireland or in some place in North London some community they would turn up and they would say that we were in the pay of Chavez and they would have a go at us it was wow. really uh, and yeah. then the second film we made which is about seven six or seven years ago now was um called Condition of the Working Class so we took Engel's book from 1844 and we updated it we we try we set up a theater company we yeah. would be the descendants of the people that Engels was talking about wow and we compared the the difference yeah so of course there's kind of differences like you know we've got entire toilets and fridges but actually the structural hasn't yeah. changed you yeah. know, from when yeah. Engels was right in the condition. Yeah. So that was our second film. Then then the, the, the third one yeah. was the acting class, the, third, the full length one. Yeah. But apart from, I mean, that's the kind of, and then what I was doing was going into prisons and working with prisoners and they were making their own films. Mm-hmm. Right. So, um, and like, I, and it, I think it goes back to what we were saying at the beginning, you know, these, these mainly, because in prisons in London, you're talking about mainly young working class black men. Yeah. Um, and they were making fantastic films. Absolutely yeah. brilliant. And some of them had never made a film before and we were getting such fantastic. So it's not that working class people don't do it. It's that they yeah. don't have the platform to do it. Yeah. But if you, yeah. and it's not, I would never ever use the word empower. <laughs> Ever. Right. It yeah. is not within my, mm-hmm. I can't empower anyone. Yeah. All I did was get permission to take in the cameras and yeah. the editing equipment. Yeah. And for two nights a week, the guys would let out their cells. This mm-hmm. was when I was doing it in um, Wandsworth Prison. Mm-hmm. For two nights a week, the guys would let out their cells. And they scripted the films, they filmed them, they edited them, they acted in them. Mm-hmm. It was absolutely brilliant. So, yeah. well, were there films about sort of their experience in there? Yeah. Did they do yeah. any class analysis? Did that come through at all, or was it not absolutely. really? No, absolutely. Yeah. I mean, I I'll send you some. Of, I'll send you one of them. There's one in particular called "Who Am I," yeah. which is so sophisticated in its analysis that looks at kind of identity in terms of a kind of global, national, and personal level. Mm-hmm. I mean, this you know, and these are young guys yeah. who haven't really have much of an education because mm-hmm. there's no point it's irrelevant to them mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. um yeah and all of the films that they made in some way or the other were about justice mm-hmm. and that I mean I mean obviously it's still mediated but rather than have these kind of self-appointed kind of voices of the working class mm-hmm. talking about people this yeah. is kind of a direct relationship this was people yeah. talking for themselves and I think yeah. that for me, that's probably the most important thing is that working class people get to represent themselves. Yeah. And they're not represented by people who have not had working class experiences. That was something that I was going to ask you about, actually, because one of the bits of work that I'm involved in um, has previously, it's it's grown from these roots of something called the Poverty Truth Commission, um, where people from low income backgrounds are um, 
you know, lived experience. There's a big trend in big organizations like councils to do something called co-production, um, where when you're writing policy or you're shaping policy that you are supposed to, it's good practice to involve people who can speak from lived experience to inform that policy. Um, and there's lots of different sort of methods that have been developed, I think, around good practice ways of working with people from low income backgrounds. And it's kind of, it's kind of good, but then there's another side of me that feels concerned about the ethics of it and whether we, meet, we need to think more carefully about how we do this. Mm. Um, who's holding the space and who's asking the questions and who's deciding what questions get asked. And, mm. and yeah, so there's, there's a feeling, I think, that it's important to nurture people through it because they're not used to talking about sensitive issues in relation to poverty in a group setting, which is fair enough. But it's kind of, if you had people talking about race discrimination, for example, or, or um, racial sort of disempowerment as a systemic issue, you were trying to unpick, unpick that with people, um, or you were touching on that issue, would it be appropriate for someone who's non-BAME, you know, to be holding that space and deciding how that should be run. And, you know, on the other hand, there aren't an awful lot of people who are from low income backgrounds who are in positions to be able to facilitate mm -hmm. those kinds of exercises. So what difference do you think it makes if it's someone who's from a working class background working with, you know? I mean, this is, I, I, mean I think it makes a massive difference. I yeah. really, yeah. I mean, I think one of the reasons that, um, you know, I, I've worked with people in prison, I've worked with kids in um, young offenders institutions, I've worked with food bank users, is because that barrier isn't there. I share the same social and economic background. I'm not, I don't judge people because they say things that I think don't mm -hmm. fit in with my kind of very metropolitan liberal kind of attitudes. Uh, so I don't, I kind of understand people mm -hmm. because I come from that background. These are, yeah these are my people this mm -hmm. is my way of life so mm -hmm. it's and I do yeah. think that makes all the difference and I think one of the things that really fucking pisses me off <laughs> is is that you know these people that say they're for equality and they are for then get off the platform mm -hmm. get off the platform it's yeah. not that we're not there mm -hmm. and it's not that we can't do it's that you're there mm -hmm. move on off mm -hmm. you know please don't tell me what it's like to live on a council estate mm -hmm. when you've never lived on one mm -hmm. please don't tell me how I should vote when you don't know how that vote will impact on me mm -hmm. you know? yeah don't tell me what I should think mm -hmm. don't impose your kind of you know thoughts on leave me. and I just think that is a massive massive problem mm -hmm. and on the left yeah um which yeah I'm kind of you know I'm, yeah. I'm loath to use that word because I think yeah. there's a real contradiction yeah. now between the left. I think there's a mm. kind of, there is a left that want kind of transformation and they want change, but mm. there's also a very kind of um, managerial left, if you like, mm. that just want to manage things. Yeah. But, you know, make it a little bit easier, mm -hmm. but not to the point where they would lose their job or their status yeah. or whatever, or, yes. the, you know, or, the, or their spots on the radio and the TV. Yeah. So, and I think that's the problem now. And mm -hmm. I think there's this massive kind of fight going on between those two sections of the left at the oh, moment. Oh, definitely. Yeah. I mean, I don't, I don't, the more managerial side, I wouldn't describe as left. Um, but no. I, th I think on, no. The, on the side that you could loosely describe as left, you know, they're, they're in favour of socialism. There's still this massive socialism I don't know I don't know how different people are defining it so differently but for mm. some people it's about making things fairer um but for other people it's about making things fair full stop you know there's that mm. big difference and then um but there's a whole with the Labour Party there's this whole history isn't there of the Fabians influence mm. on the party and the, and a deliberate intent to have a a middle a very middle class you know um group of people keeping things in you know in a certain mm -hmm. way mm -hmm. um the intention i don't think right from the beginning was ever really for it to be owned by the working class run mm -hmm. by the working class there's even you know the perspective that it was set up to divert what was becoming a, a slightly too active working class to, and to yeah. i mean i think you're right i mean i think you know traditionally the the labor party has a link to the working class because of the trade unions 
Yeah. So um, that's the kind of link. And then I think, uh, I think that's what you're saying, is that I think after 1945 and the kind of, you know, the welfare state and the NHS, mm -hmm. that a lot of working class people who would have been more radical, I think, yeah. you know, supported the Labour Party. Yeah. But I think the kind of division between the kind of economics, let's fight for a better wage, and the political, let's fight to, you know, and, you know, and the Labour Party is about parliamentary politics. It's mm. not about transforming the world. And that's always mm. been the case. Mm. And I think, you know, we've seen it. And, you know, even, even within that, I mean, I think when Blair took away clause four, mm -hmm. then I think, you know, that was the final straw for any kind of hope for mm -hmm. the working class within the Labour Party. I mean, my dad was in the Labour Party, mm -hmm. but he was in the Labour Party that had the clause four. Yeah. So that's what my dad was fighting for, nationalisation. Yes. You know, yeah. Kind of that. And he could do that. Yeah, he could he could reconcile his Marxist politics with belonging mm -hmm. to the Labour Party because there yeah. were other Marxists in the Labour Party. I mean, I'm yeah. sure there are now. Yeah. But I just think that when Blair took, you know, when Blair said, oh, that's it, we're, we're doing away with cause for that. And that's when the demographic, yeah. that's when, the, you know, the Labour Party structurally changed. Yes. And we had this kind of influx of middle class people because all of a sudden yeah. it was OK to be in the Labour Party because there was yes. no fear of nationalisation. Yes. And I remember when yeah. I was cleaning, I used to go to these houses of these people and they used to vote Labour and it was like, yeah. what? Why? <laughs> you're not working why are you that yeah. was in the 80s and the 90s and then I kind of realized of course you know Blair kind of made it um he made the Labour Party very bureaucratic mm -hmm. and this is one thing that the middle classes love it's bureaucracy yeah so they love a steering group and they oh, love yeah. a committee yeah and they like so organized <laughs> you know? like a hierarchy <laughs> oh yeah. my god absolutely so they were you know yeah and, it was really, because I was caught right in the middle of it. So I could see all this going on under Blair. And I remember this bloke, this actor, saying to me, because when Blair got um, elected, I was like, oh, my God, we're fucked. And he's <laughs> like, oh, don't be so negative. Don't be so negative. Yeah. And I said, like, no, of course, because for you, it's great. Yeah. Because you can call yourself radical. Yes. Distinguish yourself from your parents. Yes. Um, say that you're a socialist. Mm -hmm. At the same time, you can employ a working class woman on a council estate mm -hmm. to clean up your shit. Mm -hmm. And, you know, you get to have it. And that's not going to change. And you know, that's not going to change. You can be yeah. comfortable. Yeah. 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 It's so true. It's so true. And it's like, I can't remember the exact wording on the Labour Party card, but this thing to do with nationalisation, that's around collective ownership, isn't it? It's about us all becoming more equal. Hang, um, on, hang on a minute. Hang yeah. on. Sorry, sorry, Manny. No, I did find right. my dad's old Labour, I found my dad's old Labour card membership thing. And it says yeah. about, you know, owning the, the production, owning yeah. the forces of production. It says yes. it on the back of the Labour card, yeah. membership card. Yeah, yeah. Oh, my word. Oh, uh, if you can get me a picture of that, I'll put it on our website. I, I, <laughs> because... I, I actually put it up on Facebook, so I know I've got it. I'll find it yeah. and send it to you. Yeah. Awesome. Because yeah. Yeah. when you look on it now, it talks about through our collective endeavours. So the word collective is still on there I mean it might have said collective endeavors before but the thing about collective endeavors is it's only collective if you move out the bloody way for people who you know if you recognize your own privilege and you make space for that mm -hmm. working class voice to come through mm -hmm. and take an equal part in how you write your policy what your public face looks like as an organization you know what your priorities are and that that sort of um equalizing you know, um, not not the social mobility, which is everyone forever more climbing up this endless ladder as if people are never going to be needed to do cleaning jobs. You know, <laughs> no, no. But I mean, I just I mean, I, when I've, I've had this argument on Twitter a few times, I'm absolutely against people having cleaners. Mm -hmm. because the cleaners tend to come from ethnic minorities or they're poor working class women like me you know I could drop my kid off from school and then I could go and clean the house and I just think you know so people have unfollowed me on Twitter they think it's awful <laughs> but I, I don't think you know you should and they're ah, oh, you know middle class women are the fucking worst and you know I don't care I don't care if you have a demanding job. And in fact, when I, there used to be one woman in particular, none of them had demanding jobs. Mm -hmm. They just didn't want to do the cleaning and they yeah. could afford it, you know. So she yeah. used to sit there reading The Guardian, yeah. drinking her coffee and yeah. eating her biscuits while I did her ironing yeah. and washed her dishes. I mean, it was, yeah. um, but yeah. I just think, well, you know, if you if fight for a world where working class women don't have to clean up your shit mm -hmm. or clean up your own fucking shit, you know, yeah. it's just... <laughs> 
<laughs> you know, and it's like, it's about hierarchies. You know, I was in a position yeah. where I had, and I went from one house to another. Yeah. Um, and they paid me a pittance. Yes. A absolute pittance. And there was yeah. no holiday pay. There was no insurance. No. I was claiming um, benefits. So I also had the worry, because I lived on a big council estate, that someone would grasp me up mm -hmm. and tell. And nothing would happen to them if yeah. they were found paying me cash in hand, but I would lose my benefits and might be prosecuted yeah. for being a benefit cheat. Yeah. So there was all of that as well. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so I just think, I don't, I just don't agree with having servants. Mm -hmm. You can call it your cleaning lady, but basically what mm -hmm. you've got is a servant. Yeah. But of course now they don't live in, they're not in service, you know, so you have yes. no responsibility for them at all. Yes. Um, yeah. Yeah, I can hire and fire at will. Yeah. I mean, there's, there's an amazing um, women's collective uh, cleaning company in Belfast because these these were women that were doing like contract cleaning, you know, of big oh, yeah. venues. So that was mm. their job, but I don't think it was very well paid. And um, these awards ceremony came into Belfast and this big company didn't want to take on the contract. So these women went and did the job just as a one-off. And they did a really good job. Um, and I think they probably got saw what they could get paid or what the company might normally be getting paid. They set up as a cooperative um, so that each woman does each part of the process. So they all do cleaning, but they can all go and price up the job. They can do the books. They can do the PR. And they all make decisions as a collective. And they earn quite a, quite a lot more than they did you know before so they're not feeling exploited they're feeling like no. they've got a lot more agency and you know I mean I think like if we recognize that those jobs like we have done through the pandemic we've recognized those jobs are not you know um throwaway jobs oh, we low all, skill jobs no. no skill jobs it's really hard work I mean I've, yeah. I've done it and I used to go home really aching yeah. and sore yeah. and tired um I didn't mind doing it because it was nice to get in a little zone with it, but it was really poorly paid. Um, but you might have middle class people that, you know, would consider doing that kind of work, but they wouldn't consider it because of the way it's paid. It's not it shouldn't be about status. I think work should be about what kind of thing do you want to do? What are you happy yeah. doing? Let's make sure that everyone, no matter what they're doing, is paid enough that they can afford to have a, a decent standard of living. And um, absolutely. But I think I think it is about pay, but it is also about status. I mean, I think middle yeah. class people don't do these jobs because they consider them low status. But like yeah. you say, the pandemic has taught us that these yes. jobs are all, you know, things Essential. don't work properly. Yeah. Mm. If we don't yeah. have these jobs, we've not valued them properly. I, I, hope. No. I mean, what do you think about collective ownership as, as a means of working class people potentially having more agency, having more control? Having well, better it's wages? definitely. Yeah. Well, it's definitely preferable to, um, you know, working for a big corporation that can yeah. constantly is kind of knocking down your wages and expecting mm -hmm. you to do more you know yeah. neoliberal we, we've seen that so it's got to be better than privatization mm -hmm. um i mean there were when we were in venezuela there were a lot of collectives in venezuela right a lot of um it's like older working class women setting yeah. up collectives mm -hmm. you know doing cooking yeah and, and at the university they did all the um they did all the food for the university. Yeah. So it yeah. meant that, you know, they were still in the job market. Um, yeah. And, you know, they could earn themselves a different ways, whereas before, you know, so I think, you know, in when we were there, there was a kind of really kind of encouraging the setting up of collectives. Yeah, that's good. That's, I'll, I'll have to look into it a bit more because I'm interested in it. I'm interested in working class people being able to hear from other working class people yeah. who've done it and would never look back, you know. And that's that's what's dead inspiring about the Belfast Women's Cleaning Company because yeah. that's what they say. They say there's no right. way they'd go back to working for a boss. You know, they're a collective and it's their business, you know. Um, and they've got a certain culture around it, which is very equalising, whether it's the pay or it's the decision making. I think that's really yeah. important. I mean, yeah. I know that when we've taught, like gone into the prisons, one of the things that we've kind of said to the guys is there's no one's in charge. You yeah. create a group. Yes. And everyone's yeah. opinion is as valid. And yeah. no job. Well, we, we kind of, you know, encourage guys to kind of all. So someone would do the directing and someone would do the. The, the shooting and someone would do and then it was kind of swap roles yeah so these roles were kind of interchangeable yeah and everyone's input was important as everyone else because I do yeah. think that notion of the collective and that, yeah that's the other thing <clears throat> that I think is very different to working class attitudes I mean there is no sense of a collective it, mm. I've never had that 
from right. working in the university sector. Okay. Um, right. People seem to me to be very individualized, very competitive, mm -hmm. very um, jealous of their own stuff, not sharing anything, always yes. worried that someone's coming up behind them or someone, you know, it's an yeah. incredible way, you know. Yeah. I mean, I've had people say to me, I remember talking to this woman about this other part-timer and she said to me, watch your back. Yeah. As if I was kind of considered him a threat and yeah. I, I didn't. No. <laughs> it doesn't bother me. I don't, you know, I don't, yeah. it doesn't bother me. I yeah. mean, being an academic pays a lot more than being a cleaner. Mm -hmm. And for that, I'm grateful. Yes. <laughs> you know, yeah. Yeah. Um, but I'm yeah. not, I'm not in competition with anyone. I don't care no. if someone publishes more books than me. And what I, I mean, mm -hmm. that's not what I do it for. Yes. Um, yeah. Yeah, it's a different motivation. Yeah, because I, I think that people are sort of trained and socialised to, you know, they, you know, to see everything in hierarchical terms, and they mm. like to have a hierarchy to slot into, so that they know exactly what their position is in relation to everyone else and what they need to do to then go on up. <laughs> it seems to be pre-programmed. Whereas I don't know, I kind of just blunder into things and do them because they enjoy them. And <laughs> yeah, no, no, I've never had a plan. <laughs> No. <laughs> no, no, no. <laughs> yeah. Are you at a disadvantage then for not for not having a strategy and not being more? I suppose it depends, doesn't it? I don't want to be this high flying academic. I just I don't want it. I don't want the pressure. Mm. Um, I want to do my job. I've done a bit of writing. I make my films. You know, there's things I want to do, but I really kind of consciously avoid that kind of, I mean I think it's really destructive mm. and I think you know mm. I want to and I want to stay working with the people that I work with yeah um, you know I don't want to get into that oh I'm going to get do this and then I'm going to do this and then I'm going to do that I just think oh my god I just I don't want to do that it's exhausting mm -hmm. and you end up in competition with other people and I mm. think I think competitiveness is a kind of form of violence. It's mm, because yeah. you've got to be really, really focused and you've got to be prepared to kind of sell other people down the river in order to get on because that's the kind of society that we live in. So for me to step out of that mm. is, or never, never to enter into, I've never done it. Mm. I mean, mm. people have been absolutely vile to me <laughs> because <laughs> they wanted to get on. And mm. I just think, oh my God. Mm. Um, yeah um and, and partly that yeah and, and, and a lot of that is the class discrimination as yeah. if I and I just think I, I do not want so I suppose if I situate myself within that kind of framework then I'm at a disadvantage but mm -hmm my own personal framework I'm not at a disadvantage no. actually I think I'm at an advantage advantage that's what I was going to yeah. say when you said yeah. sell down the river I was going to say competitiveness is a way of commodifying people isn't it mm, you put absolutely. a value on them and a value on yourself and you think well I deserve to be higher up I you know whatever exactly it's just that like, ego yeah. Yeah. yeah yeah and um I also think advantage I mean you've got an advantage if you don't have that competitive edge in a way because you can be more relaxed and you can choose mm. to do the things you enjoy to do when your integrity is with it which is much healthier yeah. apart from anything else but also I think being working class you can see you can see things from an additional perspective that isn't available to someone who's only had privilege mm -hmm. and then you come up with good ideas you, you can see ideas that other people can't yeah. necessarily see getting people to take them seriously and listen to them can be difficult <laughs> because of the class thing but yeah. and, you know and also another thing I find is having too many ideas and not enough yeah. time and energy to do yeah. them. No, absolutely no absolutely <laughs> yeah I think that's interesting though what you're saying I think you know you talk about it earlier on when we were saying about you know not actually belonging to the middle class but then you know you know it's really more difficult now with working class people but I just think it does give you an insight being caught mm -hmm. between those two worlds, that yeah. kind of in-betweenness. So mm -hmm, you end up being neither one or the other, I think. Educationally, you're kind of not like a lot of your contemporaries mm. um, or your family. Yeah. Um, I'm, I'm the first person in my family to go to university. Yeah. My daughter then went to university. We're the only two people in our family. And we yes. come from a large family that have yeah. been to university. Mm -hmm. So that makes us different than the yeah. rest of our family. From yeah. Right? Yeah. Um, but of course, we're very different from the middle classes as well. Yes. So it's kind of, yeah. And I think 
what, like you're saying with the ideas and the in, that comes from belonging or not belonging to either yeah. world. Yeah, um, yeah. It's strange, isn't it? Yeah. You think that's what generates the ideas? The fact that you're neither this nor that. You're stuck in the middle. I, you can I see think, a lot. Yeah, I think yeah. so. Because I do think, and that's what you're saying, isn't it? I do think it gives you a kind of insight that mm -hmm. if you just stay in one or the yeah. other, yeah. that you don't actually have. Yeah. Um, yeah. Yeah, yeah, I mean, I do. I do think it's a, it's a kind of way of yeah generating ideas or or, or kind of producing insights that maybe don't. Yeah, I think it's. Do. I think there's frustration with that as well, though. I think sometimes because if you, because you're working class, you haven't like shot through the hierarchy. You won't do. So mm. it can be even though you have these insights and you have these really great ideas, it can be really difficult to get them across to people who are in a position to resource them, you know, mm. make, help make them happen or or take them seriously or whatever. It can be really, really frustrating place. To I be. Think, yeah, no, it's a problem in academia because I could yeah. never get anything done when I was just on part time hours. And like I said, I was on part time hours for kind of 20 years of just yeah. kind of, you know, short term yeah. contracts and kind of hourly paid work. So you can't apply for funding for anything and no one really takes you seriously anyway. So, mm. that, you know, yeah. And then when I did get and, and it was interesting because like I remember once I took over um, a television module. Yeah. And the first thing I did was introduce something about reality TV in class. Mm -hmm. which the Students responded to really well. And the external uh, examiner had said what an interesting uh, addition it was. Yeah. But when the person I took over from came back, the first thing she did was take it out. Right. So, yeah, yeah. Yeah. First thing she did was take it out. Yeah. What? Was very, she felt threatened or? I don't know. She's very yeah. posh, privately yeah. educated. You yeah. Know, her and her husband, both academics, you know, mm -hmm. lived in a great big house, but mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. very, very ambitious. But yeah, the first thing she did was take it out. Mm -hmm. um, so, yeah, I mean, I think. And also, you know, I remember uh, that I wanted to do a book about class, an edited collection, mm -hmm. but, and I did it with someone else, but it was their name that got it okay, not mine, because right. their name was known. Yeah. So it yeah. is it's yeah. all those kind of yeah. things. And you just come and the to same with, it becomes yeah. normal. <laughs> yeah, and it's the yeah. same with the journal. I could never yeah. have got... I mean, the journal's really interesting. I couldn't have got it off the ground, I don't think, if I hadn't had a full-time post. Mm -hmm. But the interesting thing about the journal was I put something up on a kind of, you know, an academic list, an email yeah. list. Because first of all, there was the publishers were saying, oh, it's a really dodgy time, it's COVID, we're not taking on any new journals, blah, 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 blah. Mm -hmm. And so I... Just put on something, and I said, if anyone thinks we should have a journal that deals, just, an academic journal that deals just with issues of class, can you please contact the publisher and say that you would support this journal? And there were so many people. Right. There was so, and it, it's really interesting. So there are working class academics out there, but yeah. they're all kind of scattered. Yeah. And there's no, it's what you're saying, there's no kind of collective. They're not yeah. working together. Yes. And they're all yeah. going through the same thing. Yes. It's really interesting. Yes. Um, yeah. You know, and people were writing to the publisher saying, it's shocking that we don't have this. Please, yeah. can we have this? We need to have this discussion. That's great. Um, that's and really that, that's what, so it wasn't me that got it. It was no. all these, it was a kind of collective. Yes. All these people just writing. Yes. Yeah. Um, yeah. And copying me in. And yeah, yeah. And then they went, yeah, OK, we, yeah. we will do it. You can it's do so it. It's so nice when you hear that, isn't it? When you hear that other people have got similar experiences. Yeah. I think that's one of the things that we are lacking. I mean, I think that because um, I was going to ask you if you think that the sort of hope of the working class coming back together like they did in the past and having a collective sort of political identity and awareness is dead and gone or whether that can still happen and how you think that that could happen. What are the building blocks of that? Um, one of them is obviously political education and making that accessible and interesting and relevant to people because a lot of the texts that you have to wade through with mm. marks and things like that, they're really hard to understand um, mm. and mm. off-putting, you know, but but also I think it's it's not just the reading. I think it's the opportunity to share those common experiences and recognise that we are still, there is still a, a working class that has a lot in common. Um, those conversations and whether sometimes and it might need to come first and foremost from people who are working class who have moved out of mm. you know being kind of stuck in a low income situation low status situation who have got a bit more of an analytical perspective on it 
it might need to start there. I don't know. I don't know what you, if you. No, I think you're right. I mean, it's what Gramsci said, isn't it? That we need organic intellectuals. So right. we need intellectuals that right. come from the working class. Okay. That's what we need. Yes. Um, yeah. yeah. Because then if you've got intellectuals from the working class, they can articulate a working class perspective. Yeah. They, Absolutely. yeah. Um, yeah. yeah. Because they come from the working class and they're still connected to the working class. So people like yeah. you, for instance, you yes. know, it's yeah. like, you know, people, not people that kind of give up their working class and sort of mm -hmm. think, oh, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm middle class now. Yeah. Um, and I've come across people like that. Yes, yeah. Um, yeah. You know, but I think that's what we need. We need those kind of organic intellectuals. We need mm -hmm. people who come from the working class who can articulate our working mm -hmm. class kind of needs and a, from a working class perspective, but yeah. speak that kind of language. Yes. I remember yeah. so when I started my PhD, someone said to me, oh, they'll listen to you now. Yes. That in itself, yeah. I think it was a really yeah. loaded statement. Yes. Um, yeah. yeah. Cause I, you know, my views haven't changed. No. Um, yeah, maybe I can quote Cramchy now, which I couldn't have done before, but yeah. you know, yeah. there's still this, but people will listen to you because yeah. of this whole thing around yeah. status and educational achievement. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. yeah. So I think you're, I mean, and I think we need, I mean, I suppose it, it's, it's like you say, it's a political education, but how are we defining a political education? So yes, we need to be able to um, kind of make those ideas, as, as you say, are some of them kind of really dense and obscure. We might need to make them accessible mm -hmm. um, to people. Yeah. Um, and we need to ground them in people's experiences. Yes. Yeah, um, definitely. Yeah. But also I think it, it, in terms of politics as well, because, you know, I think, is it, I can't remember the exact it, but I think it's only 8% of Labour MPs mm -hmm. who come from manual working class backgrounds. Yeah. If you go back kind of into the 1970s that was much much higher it's yes. like 40 or 50 percent yes yeah. um yeah so you know we need more people from working class backgrounds getting involved in politics mm. at every mm. level it does um, feel like that yeah it does but then I, w I worry because I'm I'm a working class I'm from working class background and I'm involved in politics and that conversation about class or even an acknowledgement that there are barriers in place that other people don't face you know it's not a welcome conversation no, uh, no one wants no. to acknowledge it you know and it's kind of like if you're inviting people into that knowing that they're going to face all of these barriers but no one's going to acknowledge them and that they're going to struggle to get anywhere you know and, and they're going to mm. struggle to be taken seriously it might knock the confidence further than if they just stayed at home and didn't bother <laughs> so, no I think you're right but I suppose it's also, but, yeah I think that's where the political education comes in as well, that, you yeah. know, we've had, we've always had to struggle. It's like yeah. you've had to struggle to get an education. I've had to get the struggle to, and we have to struggle to get our voices heard because I think, I mean, we can talk about exclusion and, you know, marginalization, but basically what we're talking about is discrimination and we need yes. to be able to call it discrimination. And we're also talking about the censorship of working class voices. So, you know, it is, so our education has to involve politics, but it also has to involve the media. I mean, one of the biggest, biggest barriers is the media mm -hmm. and the way in which they represent working class people. Mm -hmm. Not only the fact that people who have no experience of working class life do the representing, but mm -hmm. the negative way in which working class people are represented. Yeah. I mean, I think the reality TV thing has gone off a little bit now and there's been a lot written about it. But, you know, those all, you know, those awful programmes like Benefit Street. Yes. I mean, you know, just yeah. representing middle class people, uh, working yeah. class people in such negative ways. Awful. No yeah. contextualization. Mm. And that's what I mean about kind of, you know, not judging people. You have to understand why people would act in the way that they act. Yeah. Yes, um, absolutely. So I think, you know, the media, I mean, I, I'm mean, I think I said it to you before, you know, yeah. the alter this alternative media really, really pisses me off because they're not alternative media. Yeah. They they set out the kind of parameters within yeah. which anything radical can function, mm -hmm. but they never go outside of that. No. So there's never going to be anything transformative. No, you know? it does feel um, like that. It's, it's very constricting. Absolutely. And, yeah. you know, if, if, if our representatives yeah. in the media are privately educated Oxbridge graduates, mm -hmm. then, you know, 
And as mm. we talked about before, you know, their socialization yeah. is different from ours. They have a set yeah. of shared values that are very different from ours. Yes, yeah. Well, I mean, there's there's some great left alternative media that's, I mean, most of it's set up by people that are clearly middle class, but mm. not all of them, but even the ones that have popped up that purport to be, you know, a more working class voice, they never talk about issues of class or class barriers. They stay well away from it because the mm. unions don't want seem mm. to want to focus on it no, they no. seem to want it to be a conversation that's past and gone and it's like you know and, and sometimes people say well I don't see class and it's like it doesn't matter because if, if you some people say I don't see color and I don't see race that's meaningless because mm. if those systemic um sort of uh, disadvantages and pressures and and uh you know um problems are there they're there whether you choose to see it or not they still affect people you know and i just don't believe people who say they don't see cars no. <laughs> i mean we, yeah. this is england <laughs> i mean you know, how can you know you know it's the way you dress it's the way you speak it's yeah. where you live it's the food you eat everything about this country tells you about a class system a really ingrained class system so yeah. if you're saying you don't see class well, you're either blind mind or you you know you're just doing it on purpose because you have you know we have private schools Mm -hmm. what's that if it's not about class Mm -hmm. yeah we have private health care what's that if it's not about class yeah yeah the the bbc is dominated by privately educated oxbridge graduates Mm -hmm. it's about you know it's yeah. only working class people that are driving buses and cleaning houses yeah that's class you know how can you not C yeah. class yes yeah you, know, you and that's what i think what part of yeah. the problem is is that class has been euphemized so we don't use the word class mm-hmm. we use the words exclusion or we yeah. use the word low income yeah but actually what yeah. we mean are working class working people. class yes yeah. but we're not calling them that anymore yeah. Yeah, no, say anything. They'll say anything. They'll say working people. They'll say, I mean, social justice isn't too bad of a term, but they will say anything. The closest they'll get is maybe talking about social justice. Um, But it's almost like even from working class people on the left who are connected with the unions and they're well connected within the party, it's like they feel that conversation about class is divisive and it would be much easier if we've got all shut up about it and just accept that anyone who works is working class. We're the 99% and that's the end of the story. It's like no, 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 no. that's the other expression I hate. The ninety-nine percent. Yeah, uh, actually, class is divisive. Yes, it, it is. It divides us. Yeah. So you know, whether like you say, whether you talk about it or not, the divide is still there. Yeah. And the ninety-nine percent is again. I think it's really insulting to working class people. Yes, it's useful because it under identifies that kind of rather kind of nebulous top one percent that we don't really talk about yeah but to suggest that someone like me has the same experiences in the same boat as someone who went to a private school and then oxford and then walked straight into a think tank yeah that's an insult because we don't there are structural differences within that 99 percent yeah and if you don't engage with those differences Mm -hmm. then it's another way of silencing the working class yeah keeping them off the platform yeah and there's the lower middle class element as well that would like to say they didn't go to private school so therefore they are working class but if they've had a ton of privation and their parents have got you know um plenty of savings in the bank and able to support them you know at uni or whatever it is then again you know there's some hidden privileges there that mm. might not be mm. readily admitted to but it's a disingenuous to to not acknowledge that privilege as well you know and it's interesting yeah. isn't it that we can talk about other kind of privileges but we can't talk about class privilege yeah um yeah. yeah, so we can talk about kind of white privilege yes. and something that I do have some problems with, but we can't talk about class privilege because, like you say, that's considered to be divisive or old fashioned. Yeah. Um, and I think, you know, that's a strategy, that idea that, you know, class is old fashioned, because I think what it is, is it's like it's constantly reaffirming this kind of, oh, the northern cloth cat, yeah. whip it way. Yeah. And we know yeah. that, yeah, that's not yeah. the working class anymore. Mm-hmm. That might have been the working class in the kind of 50, but that isn't the working class anymore. You mm-hmm. know, but if you keep representing, oh, that's old fashioned. Yeah, of course it's old fashioned. Mm-hmm. You know, working mm-hmm. class isn't a static, monolithic no. category. It no. changes, you know, neoliberalism yeah. has brought enormous changes to the working class. Yeah. But, it yes. still remains that they are yeah. the most oppressed group and yeah. that is your class will determine the yeah. biggest determinist of yes. where you end up yes. in your life is yeah. your class yeah not your race not your gender 
yeah. not your sexuality. Yes. And I'm not saying that those things don't co- cause problems. Yeah. And I'm not saying that you can't be discriminated against. I'm not yeah. saying that. But yeah. class is the biggest determinant of yes. where you end up and how you're treated. Yeah. And it's got um, no, no protection in the law. There's no. nothing. There's no recognition. No, it's not a protected characteristic. No. Yeah. So that's that's all the more reason why we do need to make sure we keep talking about it. Um, I just wanted to um, ask you one final thing, really, was more to do with you know your work how people can access your work um and how they can if there's any way that people can get involved in or if you've got any recommendations for how people can get involved in what you do or because i know that there's the journal you inviting people to yeah maybe Uh, make submissions for that and yeah um and i don't want it to just be even though it's an academic publishing house i don't want it to be just and i'm particularly looking for so in terms of culture because it's ended up they didn't want to call it just the journal of class Mm -hmm. so it's being called the journal of class and culture which is fine yeah which is fine um so i yeah i mean i'm really interested in kind of working class cultural work Mm -hmm. So anyone that's doing any writing, um, filmmaking, any uh, kind of artwork, I'd be really, you know, representing working class life in any kind of cultural form. I'd be really interested. We've got a reviews editor. So you can contact me. But mm-hmm. and I'll give I'll pass you on to Steve, who's our reviews editor, because mm-hmm. I don't just want to be um, kind of looking at working class books. But yes, yeah. anyone who's got any ideas, anyone who might be involved, just contact me. That would be okay. brilliant. Brilliant. That's good because we need to grow our sort of networks, don't we? Exactly. Yeah. yeah. People that are involved in academia, politics, you know, right across the board, arts and, and culture. Yeah. yeah. Um, I mean, I think that's the yeah, sorry. I was just saying, I think yeah. that's a really other important thing is to think how class affects every area of our yes. life absolutely everything that we do is affected by class absolutely yeah and it's a really important point um the website that um i've I've put together the working class activist network it's not just about activism it's about doing that as well as you know making sure we platform and share um what we produce creatively as a working class you know yeah so if there's any any resources or anything that you think would be useful for us to put on there you know that's available um let me know and uh because I, I need content for that website to make sure that we get it off to a good start so if well, you've got I'll any thoughts around that the, shall i send you the links to the films then it depends all, if they're open yeah. access yeah they're all or, free online they're okay. all online yeah. that'd be great yeah that would be amazing yeah. really really good I'll, and it'd be nice I'll, for people to have one place to come where we can see who's who is from a working class background what are they involved in how can we come exactly. together for change yeah, you know, and, and have these conversations as well because I think they're yeah. important I think they've been lost and um, we've got also just um, to mention the political education project which is um, headed up by Paul O'Connell Paul, and a few yeah. others um, this it pulls on the editorial board of the journal the journal that's right yeah, yeah you mentioned yeah. Yeah, um, yeah we've got our first proper session they've already released the reading so the way they're doing it is you get your reading um just two links it is um quite long pieces but this really fantastic um group i can't, I can't remember the name but this working class um like podcast group have offered to do audio versions of the readings so oh, you can listen to them which is great for me them. yeah you'd love to clean in the floor or <laughs> yeah yeah no absolutely <laughs> folding some clothes or whatever it is you do um or while you're going for a walk or driving to work or whatever you know it can be hard to find the time to read through stuff mm, no, it's hard going um so they've got audio versions of them so you can listen to them in your own time maybe listen to them a few times you know to make sure that it kind of drops into place and then two weeks later online class where people get to discuss and break it down and understand it better um and i mean i you know i've been through those readings that they're doing for this first session through the beehive group that that um preceded this um political education project and i found some of it dropped into place and some of it didn't make sense and the second time i'm going through it it's making a lot more sense um but it's just drip drip isn't it bit by bit i think with political education just stick with it and try. yeah no absolutely yeah. yeah yeah so it's just to let people know about that so just want to say a massive thank you oh, um yes. for coming on it's just been great and, and a lot of the questions i had lined up you you sort of brought them up and you've brought other interesting things into the mix as well so i really appreciate you coming on oh, thanks for asking me i, don't, I yeah. wasn't rabbit in too much <laughs> not at all <laughs> i'm a habit of getting onto a soapbox as my husband no. keeps telling me <laughs> No, I know. I I get excited about class. I love talking about class, so I find it hard to be quiet. (laughs)